<laughs> As Neil introduced me, my name is Matthew Griffin. Uh, I'm the CEO and founder of the 311 Institute, as well as the World Futures Forum. So we are a futures and deep futures think tank and advisory. Now, essentially sort of breaking that down for you, what that means is I look at two kinds of futures. So futures, which are naught to 20 years out, and then deep futures, which are 20 to 50 years out. Now, for many of you, the organizations that you're going to be working with in the future, yeah, unless you're going to be building your own organizations, and I really encourage you to be your own bosses, uh, you're going to be interested more in the next sort of zero to 20 years, depending on that company's purview. Um, but if you're a sovereign government, typically you care about the next 50 years, particularly as it relates to the future of infrastructure, jobs, skills, energy, transportation, you know, you kind of get the, you, you get the drift. So what I've put together for you today is a presentation that's really split into three parts. So on the one hand, I'm going to reset your expectations about the technologies that are already here today. Uh, in the second part, we're going to be covering blockchain, and uh, we're going to be having a bit of a deeper dive basically into what it is, why it is, and fundamentally, what it allows us to do. Um, and then thirdly, I'm going to be talking about what I call the 100x human. Now, the reason why I've put this in there is because as you start entering the workforce over the next number of years, it's highly likely that you are thinking in a relatively linear way. I'm going to show you and literally, I'm going to show you the technologies that you will be able to use when you are going to work to boost your productivity, not just by tenfold, potentially not even really by a hundredfold, but by much more than that. And if you think that that's crazy, then just wait to the show and tell at the, uh, at the end. Um, so, uh, as Neil introduced me, but see, I'm, I'm a futurist, but I'm also a strategic advisor. Um, I work with the vast majority of organizations that are both in your pocket that you are using on daily, using and consuming on a daily basis. Everyone from companies like Arm, T-Mobile, where we discuss the future of 5G and 6G, companies like Huawei and Samsung, where I help them envision the next 50 years of gadgets and devices and things. Uh, so if you have a Samsung phone, basically my little fingerprints are all over that. We can, and there's an interesting KX50 report you can download that uh, takes a deeper look into what life looks like in 2069, which is Samsung's uh, 100th, 100th birthday. Um, we've got organizations like Denton's, which are the world's largest law firm, especially GEMS, so GEMS is the world's largest private school company, um, as well as organizations like Ernst & Young, the UAE government, the UK government, and so on and so forth. So it used to be the case, if you move back about five or 10 years ago, and you said that you were a futurist, people just thought you'd get out this crystal ball and it was a bit meh, you know, it's another word for being unemployed. But as the future starts moving faster, as things start getting more complex, that's where I start coming in to help organizations, as well as individuals, really dig into what the future looks like, how you can build it, and fundamentally how you can lead it. So with no more further ado, and uh, my ego quite nicely satisfied, um, if you want to download any of the things that I'm talking about today, I'll give Neil a coupon code. You can go to the www.311institute.com website. Uh, if you want to have a look at any of the emerging technologies that I discussed during this presentation, you can download this free codex. It's got about 250 exponential technologies listed in it, including what they are, why they are, why you should care, their state of readiness, the impact that they'll have on the world, as well as sort of general society at large, as well as industries, uh, and all kinds of sort of different things. And um, if you want to delve into the world of creative machines, we'll come on to those in a little bit. Uh, if you want to have a look at tractor beams, teleportation, if you want to have a look at molecular assemblers, uh, if you want to have a look at things like neurobionics, and I'd encourage you to actually have a look at that one, uh, neurobionics and neurobiotics are two individual exponential technologies that are already being used by the US military to create conscious robots. Literally, conscious robots. Whichever way I break that down, robots that are conscious, not fake consciousness. So um, when we talk about technologies, we are much further along than anyone really realizes. But these are, there's a whole chunk of free resources that you can dive into at your leisure. Uh, and if you want to be freaked out, fantastic. It's the site for you. Now, um, I also run the Exponential University. And the part, part of the reason why I do that is because I've got two six, I've got 
two six-year-olds and an eight-year-old. Um, and frankly, the current industrial age education system isn't necessarily, I feel, preparing them for what's coming. Um, so, for example, you, know, you guys basically at, at the moment basically are sitting watching this lecture. My kids are already starting to use artificial intelligence, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, behavioral computer interfaces where they're talking to the machines. Um, they are already where, way beyond where millennials were about 10 years ago. So when a new generation is born into a particular type of technology and a technology situation, that becomes their status quo. Yeah, my kids will never ever know what it's like basically to have to wait five minutes, ten minutes, or have to go down a uh, yeah, to get a movie, or go down to a uh, to rent to to video store to rent a video, or etc. 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 Yeah. So um, yeah, all this stuff is increasingly fast and furious now. This particular diagram that I'm showing you here, I would encourage you to think about this, not just today, but throughout the rest of your lives. This is a Japanese framework. It's called the Akagi framework. Uh, it's your reason for being. And as you can see, it breaks down lots and lots of different areas, including sort of what your power, you have to try to find out what you really want to do with your lives. What are you passionate about? What are you good at? You know, what does the world need? And more importantly, how can you make money from whatever that thing is because you need to be able to put a roof over your heads? So I'd encourage you to look into this framework deeper. Um, from a creativity standpoint as well, use the clicker. Um, from a creativity standpoint as well, we are always told that in an increasing age of automation, creativity is, increase, is an increasingly important skill. Now, there are arguably at least four types of creativity. So you've got internal creativity, such as going and having conversations with, with your other classmates. Um, you've got uh, physical, you've got physical and personal creativity. So that's just obviously naturally your own creativity. But then you also have team creativity and you've got something called augmented creativity. And when we talk about augmented creativity, this is where you are able to go out, use different technologies, different tools, different constructs to pretty much supercharge your own creative power. And I'm going to be demonstrating that later on. So here we go. Now, one of the problems that I have as a futurist is what I call the time traveler's dilemma. So I was educated in the 80s and the 90s. Now, if I went back to all of the deans of all of the major universities, let alone the policymakers, let alone the prime ministers and presidents in the 1980s, and I said, I come from the future, from the date 2021, and I have perfect knowledge. And in the date 2021, I can see that there is a huge demand for data scientists. I can see there's a huge demand basically for people who can build artificial intelligences, software developers, and all these kinds of things. I might get asked this question. What's a cybersecurity analyst anyway? Um, I will then respond saying, well, a cybersecurity expert or analyst is somebody who protects the internet and all of the critical things that are connected to the internet, like assets, financial information, et cetera, et cetera, uh, from hackers basically who want to access it for nefarious purposes. So you can imagine the scene. Um, However, at that point, all the deans basically will then likely come to me and say, well, okay, that's, that sounds interesting. It's like a sort of, like a policeman, I guess. What's this thing called the internet? And at that point, I'll then say, the internet basically is this set of connected people and devices and things that has connected three and a half billion people on the planet together and has changed every single aspect of global culture, society, and industry. And at that point, I will get shown this, the futurist's equivalent of the door. And even if I went back 10 years ago and I had a similar conversation with a lot of the automotive CEOs and said, in 10 years time, you will be electrifying all of your cars. You'll be turning them into autonomous vehicles that you no longer sell to consumers, but that you sell as a service. Again, I'd be likely kicked out of the door. And yet here we are. You know, both of these realities are real. So when futurists come to business leaders and say, in the future, there will all be all these fantastical things, there is a lot of fantastic things coming down the line. And a lot of them, frankly, 
do sound unbelievable, but that's why I'm going to show you rather than just talk about them. Today, we're all being all disrupted, and I'm not just talking about being disrupted by digital humans like me. So, for example, in the future, when you actually get into the workforce, you could very well find yourself competing against Digital Doug. So Digital Doug, basically, is an artificial intelligence-based digital human with a neural network brain. As we increasingly start seeing conversational artificial intelligence making its presence felt on the global stage, he's going to get better and better and better. He's going to be plugged into all kinds of data sources. He'll be able to help you negotiate. He'll help you uh, help you develop strategy. We'll come on to this in a little bit as well. He's going to help you do all kinds of things. He's going to be your co-worker. He's going to be your competition. Now, this session basically is going to be around an hour. Um, so feel free to go and grab yourselves a coffee. Uh, we have molecular coffees, basically from companies like Atomico, which is coffee that is allegedly better than Starbucks, but without the coffee beans. So if we start talking about the sustainability of that, uh, you can 3D print yourself some chocolate if you've got a 3D printer uh, knocking around at home, which you probably don't. But you know, you probably know where you can get one. Um, you can order the Chef Jet from Amazon, basically, if you did want to 3D print your own chocolate. It's about $1,000 at the minute. It's going to come down in cost because technologies always come down in cost. They get faster, more ubiquitous, and they get cheaper and they get smaller. Now, just kicking this off, how many of you believe in magic? You, know, you all go to university, which means that anything that I show you, you will typically think of in terms of science fact. You'll typically think of it in terms of technology and technology tricks. If I went back 100, 200 years ago and I showed the people of that particular time what we're doing here today, a man in a box, uh, let alone basically the big artificial suns that are over your head, the lights um, that you see, let alone basically the cars that we have on our streets that would have made ancient, ancient, Olympic, <laughs> ancient Greek Olympians, easy for me to say, yeah, swear and curse basically into their hummus. Today, we are doing some staggering things. So I'm going to show you some of these things. Today, we have the technology to stream your thoughts, the images that you are thinking, directly to YouTube. We do this using brain machine interfaces and artificial intelligence. And in three years' time, these images will be high definition. Five years ago, we didn't have the technology to do this. If you want holograms, if you like Blade Runner 2049, basically the production company behind them, they're actually one of my customers, and they're awesome, by the way. Uh, this is the granddaddy of the Blade Runner 2049 dancing holographic ballerina. So this one is a genuine, living, 3D, free air hologram. We're not using augmented reality, we're not using glass, we're not using any tricks, we're not using volumetric displays. This is the real deal. And we do it using femto lasers. So, however, in the next 10, 20 years, it's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. It's going to get more complex. It's going to be able to do better and bigger things. So these are two science fiction technologies that are here today that you can go and reach out and touch, that you can go and read the peer review papers on to go and build yourself. But that's not all. There's a lot more to come. In 2015, uh, DARPA, along with different elements, especially of the US military, managed to upload knowledge matrix style to people's brains. Now, how they managed to do that is, again, they managed to use artificial intelligence in a particular way. But the brain is plastic. Go and have a conversation with any neuroscience at M any neuroscientist at MSU. They will tell you the brain's plastic. Yeah, what I'm saying to you here is already getting information into your brain. Increasingly, we're able to use technology to get information into your brain in new ways. And this would be fantastic uh, as a tool for uh, Neil's blockchain class. So what we did here is we put 30 fighter pilots into a F-35 simulator, took the F-35s up to 30,000 feet, put them into a flat spin, and we got the Top Gun fighter pilots to try to actually recover from a flat spin and land the aircraft while recording their brainwaves. They did all that successfully. Then we took 30 volunteers who've never been in an aircraft before, put them into the same flight simulator, did the same thing. 
took the F-35s, especially up to 30,000 feet, put them into a flat spin, replayed the brainwaves from the Top Gun pilot, especially to these volunteers, and 60% of the volunteers landed the aircraft with no prior experience. And the reason why they managed to do that was because the brain is plastic. Uh, the reason why the 40% of people didn't manage to actually land the aircraft, though, is because they didn't have the right tactile or kinetic responses. So if you've ever watched The Matrix, where Liberty basically uploads information that helps her fly a, a Bell Huey helicopter, this is kind of the same tech. In fact, it's very similar to the tech. When we start talking about other science fiction things, molecular assemblers, we've already built molecular assemblers. So we can do that in one of two ways. We can either use molecule-sized robots and create a production line that then we then use to create molecular-sized products. We can use DNA robots. And again, look all this stuff up. Um, in addition to that, though, uh, we've actually had a variety of different universities around the US who've actually used viruses to create molecular assemblers that are now being, made, being used to make some next-generation lithium-ion batteries for the next-generation electric vehicles. So when people tell you that molecular assemblers are impossible, they're already here. But again, they're basic, and they increase in speed, complexity, and all that kind of stuff as we uh, go through time. Telepathy. Uh, in 2015, again, the US military, as well as Harvard, basically managed to put two people together, basically using brain-machine interfaces and, again, artificial intelligence, and they were able to communicate telepathically. About two years ago, we managed to use a similar construct of the technology to allow three people in a construct called BrainNet to play Tetris together telepathically. Um, and now, again, we actually have the US military that is now trying to create technologies with a number of universities that will help them to help one person telepathically communicate images directly to the other person's brain wirelessly. And as for things like tractor beams, tractor beams exist, but if we need a practical application for some of these science fiction-like things, what about using tractor beams to reinvent 3D manufacturing or additive manufacturing? So here's an example. This is now an old example, and we've got lots of other tractor beams that are now coming through. So this is a sound-based one using ultrasound um, and what we sort of call vortices. But you, we've got light-based tractor beams and uh, a number of other sort of different types of uh, tractor beam-like technologies that are coming through, particularly when it sort of relates to things like uh, ultrasonic holograms. Uh, so if you want to play air guitar, I'm rubbish at playing air guitar. We can use these types of technologies to actually help you play air guitar, literally, and feel objects midair and all kinds of crazy things. But here you can see that we're using the tractor beam. We're using a 3D printed PCB, and then we are using a tractor beam to move components around. And these components are then welded into place on the PCB uh, using just a conventional laser. So this means that we can 3D print products like smartphones, and they can be then used to self-assemble those products. And there we go. Now, however, you know, when we start having a look at things like the United Nations Sustainable Development, Development Goals, there are 17 of them, one of the things that keeps cropping up is the statement from the United Nations that by the year 2050, we will have between 11 and 12 billion people on the planet. And frankly, we're all going to be starving. However, what if I could take one cell from one chicken and use that single cell to feed the entire planet without killing the chicken? Now that sounds like science fiction. So let's talk science fact. We've all been there, right? In the grocery store. Oh, I'll just buy this meat. And there it is. And all we have to do is buy it. We don't have to think about what it took to make that chicken in, in that nice packaging. But the reality of the way that it came about, it's incredibly unsustainable. And that's one of the biggest problems facing humanity right now. But we figured out a way to solve it. The whole idea is that that chicken in itself has 
an unlimited source of itself and there is a way where you can take just a handful of cells and keep growing them essentially infinitely. For those very first cells, it was important to us how we got the cells, not just that we got the cells. We came up with the idea to use one feather from the single best chicken that we could find. We picked up. First thing we need to do is we need to identify a cell that we are going to use as the basic starter material. And then what we need to do is find a food for it to grow in. So we have to identify the right set of nutrients that will cause the cells to multiply, but not just multiply, but do so quickly and into high density. It was an out-of-body experience to sit there and, and eat a chicken, but have the chicken that you're eating running around in front of you. You don't imagine doing something like that. So that technology there used to be sci-fi. Now, the meat that you can use, produce using that type of technology about seven years ago would cost $250,000 a pound. It's now down at $363 a pound, and actually it's coming down to $5 and $15 per pound. It's also been approved for sale as chicken nuggets in Singapore if you want to actually go and try them. So when we start having a look at all the United Nations sustainability development goals, so poverty, famine, you know, education, inequality, all kinds of different things, we have lots of new technologies that we can combine together with human ingenuity to do new extraordinary things in new ways that impact people not just basically at a regional scale, but at a global scale. You live in truly awesome times where one person now, provided you can have the right idea and you can execute correctly, you can impact the lives of billions of people. If you step back 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, you couldn't have, unless especially you were some superstar. Um, so the power is definitely with you. Now, when we start having a look at disruption, you are going to be living in a world where I say, that is absolutely rife with a disruption. But disruption itself is far, getting faster and faster and faster. Now, if we move back and we start having a look at the advent of the television, for example, uh, the first 50 million users, it took 75 years for the television to acquire 75 million users. Pokemon Go, which is essentially a digital product in a hyper-connected digi hyper digital world, managed to acquire the same number of users in just a couple of weeks. Call of Duty managed to acquire 100 million new users in a couple of days. But when we start talking about the pace of disruption accelerating, we are now already at the point where we can disrupt an entire global industry in one day. So let me give you an example. A little while ago, Facebook created a new type of cryptocurrency called Libra. Now, Facebook is obviously a huge, gigantic platform. Facebook could have put Libra into the Facebook platform, had the regulators, and we'll come to them in a minute, had the regulators actually approved it, at which point Libra could have been accessed instantly by 2.2 billion people on the planet. Now, all of the central banks that were involved in looking at and evaluating Libra all said, so from the US Fed to the UK Bank of England, basically to the European Central Bank, to the People's Ch Bank of China, every single governor of every single central bank said that Libra posed a threat to the state's control of money that could have changed the global financial system overnight because of the way that it packaged its currencies together. But that's another story. So we already live in times where the pace of disruption is no longer decades or years. It's weeks and months. Technically, it's days once you've built your product. And technically, we could actually even say it's hours. 
Imagine any large platform like Google, for example, rolling something new out. Anyone who uses that service can adopt that service like that. And that could change the status quo of something, culture, society, an industry. Take deepfakes, they're a great example, basically, of changing the status quo very, very quickly than ever before. Now, if I asked you this question, if we were there together, um, do you think that we are now moving faster as a society today than we did 10 years ago? Now, when I ask my global audiences this question, 98, 99% of all the people put their hands up and think that we're moving faster today than we did 10 years ago. And that's even pre-COVID. Um, when I ask this next question, do you think that in the next 10 years, thanks to technology, but we are going to be moving faster or slower than we are today? The answer, or again, always comes back, unless the guy's retiring, always comes back, basically, faster. Now, this is the thing. Today, basically, as students, basically, you'll be thinking linearly. You'll think that tomorrow looks a little bit like today, just slightly different. Next week looks a bit more different. Next year looks a bit more different. And then we can get out of lockdown again. And then it's really different, and we're looking forward to that. Um, but from a company perspective, when you go and work for organizations, if those org any of those organizations ask you to develop a strategy, a horizon strategy, and they say, what we want you to do is want you to have a look at the next 10 years of our industry and then come back to us with a point of view. If everything is moving faster today, let alone tomorrow, is that 10-year view that you have, whether it's of your career, whether it's of your company, whether it's the company that you're building, whether it's you know, the skills or expertise that you're trying to acquire, is that really a 10-year view or is that a seven-year view? Is a five-year view really a three-year view? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you need to fundamentally adjust how you think of time, which is an interesting concept itself. So we call that the exponential mindset. The future is also getting more complex. It's also getting more confusing. And part of the reason for that is if I stepped back to the 1980s and we were able to have this conversation then, and I said, what do you think you're going to be able to do with technology next year that you couldn't do this year? You might look at something like Moore's Law and think, well, next year computers are going to be more powerful and they're going to be cheaper per IOP. Um, and you'd sort of be right. So you'd say, well, you know, I could likely ingest more information. I could analyze more information. And with that, I could do something, you know, whatever that something is. If I asked you that exact same question today as business leaders, you're dealing with this. You're not dealing with one exponential technology any longer. You're dealing with hundreds. So for example, what are you going to, if you were going to be building a company, a product, a service, if you were going to be working for a company, building a product or a service or whatever it happens to be, what are you going to do with 5G, artificial intelligence, augmented reality? What are you going to be doing with 3D printing? What are you going to be with doing with blockchain? We'll come on to that in a bit. Quantum computing. Quantum computers are going to be, they're already here, but they're going to be really commercially available in about 2025. They're 100 million times more powerful than the things that you have on your desk. And they're already the most powerful type of supercomputer on the planet. It's called quantum supremacy. You can look that one up. Um, but robotics, you know, and when we think about robotics, robotics aren't just hardware robots. They're software robots as well. And then we have some odd stuff in the middle, which we'll cover. Virtual reality, what are you going to be doing with that? And then if you are going to be building next generation products and services for whatever reason, to solve whatever problem, how are you going to be able to combine all these different things together to create something that's impactful? Now, on that little sort of chart there, there are about, what, eight exponential technologies, but there aren't eight exponential technologies. And this is why the future is increasingly fast, furious, and this is why it's increasingly complex and confusing. So this is my Starburst. This is in the, if you go and click the QR code at the bottom, you can download this. Uh, there's a link to it, um, and list, along with all the details of all the different technologies in there. These technologies are already here for you to go and prod and poke. 98% of all of the breakthrough technologies that come out come from universities. So for example, at MSU, do you know basically that you've grown a heart in a dish? That's it. So go and reach out to your fellows on campus uh, when you get back to campus and uh, ask them to go and uh, show it to you. 
Um, so, for example, we're seeing the advanced manufacturing space. If you combine all these different technologies together, you create new products and services. Um, we've got 3D printing that disrupts the $10 trillion um, manufacturing market. We've got bioprinters. I showed you Ian the chicken. Ian the chicken and solving global famine essentially comes down to putting a stem cell or a chicken cell into a bioreactor and then scaling that up. Um, we've also got 4D printing. So NASA, for example, is starting to use 4D printing to 4D print satellites and space stations eventually in space in low Earth orbit that are then capable of self-assembly. Um, when we start going around biotech, you know, for example, we've got gene editing technologies like CRISPR. Um, we've got contagious vaccines, which will come, come in useful for the next pandemic. Um, we've got in vivo gene editing. So again, we are at the point where if you are born with an inherited genetic condition, historically, like Hunter's syndrome, historically, you'd be told two things. You'd be told with Hunter's syndrome that the good news is you will die in 20 years. The bad news is, though, you will die painfully. Take paralysis. If you are paralyzed yesterday, most people will tell you you are paralyzed for life. That's not the case. But back to Hunter's syndrome. We took a patient in the US, this is now about two years ago, and there are more trials going through now, where we used an in vivo gene editing therapy, put it into an intravenous drip, put the patient in bed, gave him a cup of tea, he sat there for half an hour, undid the drip, got out, he's cured. So we are already at the point where we can genetically engineer living humans' DNA and genomes while they are lying in bed. And you can use that same technology to cure over 6,000 inherited genetic diseases. Uh, we also have things like um, mRNA. So we've got aerosol-based mRNAs. Uh, we can put that same gene editing tool into an aerosol or a nebulizer that helps cure people with cystic fibrosis. And these are here again. You can go and read the peer review papers. Um, when we start having a look at compute, you know, you will be watching this on a traditional computer that has a silicon based CPU. We have quantum computers coming through. We have neuromorphic computers coming through, which pack all of the power of the world's largest supercomputers onto something the size of a fingernail that's powered by a AA battery. Uh, in addition to that, uh, we have biological computers coming through both in the US as well as, the, as well as China. A biological computer is where we either turn a person and or a bacteria and or living cells into dual core computers that are able then to compute, store and replay information. So in China, they're on the fifth generation of biological computers. We have chemical computers coming through where we have chemicals that do the computing. So this is bases and acids. We have liquid computers that are just emerging. We've created the first liquid storage. We've also created the first liquid CPUs. The US military, again, basically has got something called the MIS program, the Molecular Information Systems Program. That's where we use polymers and a variety of different technology, computing technologies, to pack a hyperscale Google data center and you know how, those, how big those are, hence the word hyper, into something that is no bigger than your desk. And that's all the network, the compute, and the storage. We've got Microsoft trialing DNA storage. DNA storage can pack 213 petabytes, basically onto a gram of DNA. To put it into context, you can store all the world's information in a shoebox. And you'll be able to access that service via the cloud very soon. Uh, courtesy of companies like Twist Bioscience, I see as well as Microsoft and a bunch of others. Um, when we have a look at things like connectivity, we've got 5G, we've got 6G, we've got low Earth orbit satellite systems from the likes of SpaceX, which are hooking up the next three and a half billion people on the planet. Um, we've got 7G coming. You know, 6G itself, which is about 2030, it operates at terabit speeds. At that point, you can enable human to human telepathy in real time. And that's actually a thing. Um, and it's also been demonstrated, which is the crazier thing. Um, energy systems, renewable energy. Basically, we have pathways basically to fusion. Basically, we have solar power plant. We've got solar panels. Today, they're about 17% efficient. Uh, the records for silicon solar panels basically are 23%. 
If you use bacteria in a solar panel, you get to 50% efficiency. If you put carbon nanotubes into a solar panel, you can get to 80% efficiency. And if you use black silicon in a solar panel, you can get to 132% efficiency. Fossil fuels are dead. When you start putting all these different technologies into a photovoltaic material, um, you can start running your house using solar when it snows, when it rains, because you can put a layer of graphene over those, and when rainfall falls on graphene, it generates electricity. Um, we can generate electricity from the moon using solar panels, because we've got breakthroughs in what we call nanophotonic materials. So if you think solar panels today basically are rather clunky, not that efficient and everything else, the, the US Department of Energy has got a solar concentrator which is 48% efficient, efficient, and it's built. But anyway, uh, and we can sort of go around these and everything else, but um, I'd encourage you to have a look at the codex. Um, and then f we've got telepathy from, a user, from an end user perspective. We've got basic holodex, basically, which is another sci-fi technology courtesy of parallax screens. We've got all kinds of good stuff coming through. And when we have a look at the traits of all these different exponential technologies, when I say they get better cost performance over time and they get smaller, this is just storage, but you can apply this to almost any type of technology from sensors to cameras to you name it. In 1956, if you wanted a gigabyte of storage, it would cost you a good couple of tens of millions of dollars and you'd have to load it into a cargo plane. Fast forward to 2019, basically, and you're pretty much picking this stuff up for free. Um, the change in cost performance between 1956 and 2019, just on a storage perspective, is, is, is 14 billion, with a B. Now when we start looking at what tomorrow's storage platforms are going to be made out of, we're moving from hard drives to solid state. Um, we've got a terabyte on solid state that now fits on your fingernail or on your finger. Um, we've got a whole variety of different technologies, but this one's DNA. So again, 213 petabytes based in a single gram of DNA. These are exponential technologies. So in 10 years time, if you were doing something called skating to the puck, building a new product or service, what could you do with DNA based storage? Bearing in mind, it's also a wet type of storage. Um, we, could we could literally turn the human's oceans into a supercomputer using liquid computing, chemical computing, and technologies like this. We go are going into a crazy world. We already live in a crazy world. But now when we start having a look at blockchain, um, we've got a whole variety of different things that are being used, uh, or blockchain uh, use cases at the moment. So I'd like you to introduce you to Anna. Anna is my digital human, and simply because I couldn't be bothered, um, I thought I'd have Anna introducing blockchain to you. Blockchain is a system of recording information in a way that makes it difficult or impossible to change, hack, or cheat the system. A blockchain is essentially a digital ledger of transactions that is duplicated and distributed across the entire network of computer systems on the blockchain that enables different third parties to transact and trust one another without the need for an intermediary. Well, thank you, Anna. Um, now, she's actually starting to take over some of my presentations as well, so frankly, she's starting to automate me, so I better step it up. Now, when we have a look at blockchain use cases, uh, we can create things called sovereign ID systems that give you granular level control over your personal data. Um, so privacy and data collection today, basically, is a top of mind topic, for example, with the US Senate and Congress, um, but they're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. Uh, if all of you see your own images in your webcams, like I do, using artificial intelligence and machine vision, whether you know it or not, I can give you a complete healthcare and mental health checkup without you having to do anything. And the reason why I can do that is because I can get artificial intelligence, and these systems exist, I can get artificial intelligence to scan your faces. So by scanning your face, they can detect your blood pressure from the flushes in your skin. They can detect whether you are prone to having heart attacks. They can tell me whether or not you have pancreatic cancer, because when you get pancreatic cancer, the yellows of your eyes, uh, or the, uh, your eyes change uh, to a yellowish tint. Um, I can tell whether or not you're lying to me, because this stuff is now as accurate as a polygraph test. 
I can tell your character. I can tell your personality. I can trust your. I can tell your trustworthiness. So in China and Israel, they can tell someone's character, personality, and trustworthiness slash intent to criminality with an eighty percent accuracy. Um, in addition to that, if uh, this, if you are now having a in having an interview with future companies. Over 80% of the Fortune 500 are using artificial intelligence in their hiring practices, which means that while you and I are having an interview, I'm actually testing you for all kinds of different things. I can detect whether you're lying. I can detect from the webcam whether you have an inherited genetic condition. I can tell from the microphone how well you are. Um, I can tell from the microphone whether or not you have COVID courtesy of different American universities, because when you get COVID, your voice changes. Um, I can tell whether you are happy or depressed, whether you have PTSD, because when you have PTSD, you talk in a rather monotone fashion. Um, I can tell whether you're getting dementia and all kinds of different things. So all of these incredibly powerful technologies are not only increasingly affordable and accessible, but they are democratizing access to services in a way that we could never have imagined before. And you can take that, you can shove all this particular technology into an autonomous car, into a hiring system, into a dystopian surveillance system, and all kinds of things. And then you can use the blockchain to figure out what everyone is doing with your data and whether or not you actually like that or not, and you can rescind it. Um, we're using blockchain basically to help artists get paid their royalties and their, what they're due. Um, we're all, we can also start using blockchain to create what we call the metaverse. Now, the metaverse, for any of you that have played, say, Minecraft or Call of Duty or Roblox, you'll all know that the one thing that you can't do is you can't take a Roblox character and teleport it into Minecraft. The blockchain enables that. So you can actually have this concept from a digital perspective of the metaverse where you can move characters between different metaverses, different games, different digital platforms and all sorts of things. Um, next up, actually, we actually have blockchain is increasingly being used by the, the global logistics industries, companies like Maersk, uh, to help track goods basically throughout their entire life cycle as well as help them speed customs. Um, for example, we can use it to track fish. So when we catch tuna, so this is from a couple of years ago, but uh, when you catch tuna, you can record all those tuna catches basically on the blockchain. And then when this particular piece of tuna turns up in your supermarket, you can scan the QR code and you can tell precisely who caught it, where they caught it, when they caught it, how it's been transported, um, what's been done to it, all kinds of things. So when we start talking about supply chain, supply chain transparency and provenance, blockchain is perfect for that. Um, in addition to that, you know, when we start looking at how we combine different technologies together, I can 3D print a flexible electronic sensor, slap it onto a strawberry. This is actually a form of edible electronic. So on the one hand, I can now track that particular strawberry's provenance throughout the entire supply chain. But then I can eat it as well. And it doesn't, and the, the electron, the, the edible electronic uh, device doesn't do anything bad to me, it just dissolves. So when you think about electronics, we are fundamentally reimagining electronics. And if you think just how powerful compute and electronics have been over the past decades and how they've transformed the world, this is just the tip of the iceberg. And again, when we have a look at the future of electronics, that's in the codex, you can go and have a look at that. Um, in addition to that, we can use blockchain to secure your medical data. Now, um, in a sort of little bit of a futurist twist, recently we had an Israeli company that 3D printed a mini, a beating mini human heart. Today it's about this big, but over the next 10 years it'll get to human size. Uh, and you can simply, if you have a heart attack in the future, and you guys basically will benefit from 3D printed human organs. Um, if in your 30s, 40s, 50s, basically you have uh, an unfortunate accident, and let's hope that doesn't happen, and say, for example, you have a heart attack or something like that, um, we are already at the point, we're certainly with bone, skin, uh, corneas, um, and all, you know, cartilage and all kinds of other sort of parts of the human body where we can 3D print them. Um, when we start thinking about 3D printing pancreases, livers, hearts, that's really 2040 onwards before you can go to an American hospital, say, I've had a heart attack, 
uh, and they go, so, okay, we've got two options for you. Um, uh, the cheap option is we can just use your pluripotent stem cells that we've got on file, because um, we've got your genome on file, and we can 3D bioprint you a human heart, which is yours. It's not someone else's. It's yours. It's made up of your own genome, and we can just transplant that into you. Alternatively, I can 3D print you a human heart, so your human heart again, but if you want, you can have the deluxe version, and it can be augmented with electronics and sensors and everything else. And if it detects the fact, if it detects any weirdness um, and it starts shutting down or it misses a beat or whatever it happens to be, we can use those electronics to shock it so you don't end up having a heart attack and you don't end up dying. So this is the concept basically of hybrid organs. And we created the first hybrid organs, which are a combination of biological tissue, but also flexible electronics and flexible compute uh, a number of years ago. So you will benefit from these technologies, as well as all the other biotech technologies, basically, that I uh, highlighted. Um, we can use blockchain to secure the voting system. Um, but just as we can use blockchain to do lots and lots of really great things, blockchain is also the ultimate surveillance tool. Now, let's take, for example, cryptocurrencies. One of the reasons why China particularly is so interested in developing its own national cryptocurrency is because if you use a digital yuan, um, they can track every single purchase in the country in real time. Now, on the one hand, basically, that helps the Chinese government know what you are all doing. Secondly, it also helps them know what you're spending your money on and what you're not spending your money on. So from a Chinese and from a government, government perspective, the introduction of a digital yuan all of a sudden means that you are able to uh, see which parts of the economy are doing well, which ones aren't, and if you can see a particular region or a particular part of the economy that isn't doing well, you can enact real-time policies to change how people behave. You could maybe give people a tax break on buying particular types of goods, basically out of Shenzhen, uh, if you see that particular type of goods aren't selling very well, and so on and so on. So we end up with very new societal and geopolitical systems, basically thanks to this technology. Um, we can also use this same technology to give refugees an ID. Over 2 billion people on the planet have no ID at the moment. If you went up to most people, or to these 2 billion people, and said, can you prove who you are? They wouldn't be able to. Um, whether it's because they've been displaced or whether it's simply because it's the culture that they've sort of been born into. Um, in addition to that, we can also use blockchain to help reduce, and we are using blockchain to help reduce instances of traffic, of uh, child smuggling and child trafficking. Um, blockchain, aka kind of cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, are also being used by activists. Because one of the first things that happens if you're an activist in a re relatively authoritarian country is your bank balances get cut off, or your bank access to banks uh, gets cut off. So this is where cryptocurrencies are increasingly being used as an alternative means to fund activism um, anonymously. Um, but then as we start having a little look, basically, at the future, um, when it comes to blockchain, we already have around 20 fully autonomous companies now. So by combining artificial intelligence, whether it's AI or whether it's robotic process automation with blockchain, you can create companies that have no people, no bosses that operate ad infinitum. So Uber will be one of the best examples and biggest examples of a fully autonomous company because it's transactional. Blockchain loves transactions. Artificial intelligence and automation loves tactical transactions. And you can imagine that now. You get rid of the driver in the car and you end up with a blockchain version of Uber that can take data in and simply says, I know that that person's there, they want a ride, so I send an autonomous vehicle to pick them up, drop them off over there, and I repeat, and I charge them, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You will be going into a world, certainly in about the, when you're in your 30s and 40s, you will see more fully autonomous companies coming through. Um, so uh, we've also got autonomous companies operating out of Wall Street and Hong Kong as well, uh, in the financial services sector, where they're investing money. Um, hive minds. Now, if you think about this, when we, Neil mentioned basically the Internet of Things, um, the blockchain again is perfect for the Internet of Things. But if I'm able to put intelligence at the edge of the network, uh, 
then if I have a device in one part of the world that is connected to the cloud and artificial intelligence, we can create a hive mind construct. And I'll give you some examples rather than just talk. Um, now, that particular thing, let's say, for example, we've got an autonomous vehicle in Japan. It sees a particular thing, maybe a particular shadow on the road. It's not sure what it is, so it drives over it and it understands that a shadow that looks like that is actually just a shadow. It's not a rock or something. Um, it can communicate what it finds and its experience to all of the other cars that are connected to the same system, to the same hive construct. So that car in Japan can teach a car in America that if it sees a thing that looks like this, it's not actually a rock, it's a shadow. Now at the moment, so we've got Google, where you can teach one robot one thing and it will teach the rest of the fleet instantly. To reprogram individual robots used to cost about $50,000, that goes away. Um, we can also use human telepathy uh, to train robots telepathically using our minds to do whatever we want to do. There's a robot called Baxter uh, you can go and have a look at. Um, that's where we simply teach the robot uh, using telepathy to do new things. And then that robot similarly can then start teaching the rest of its fleet to do that same thing. Um, or a variant of if you want. Um, but so today basically we've got this hive mind construct which really applies basically to machines and devices. But about three years ago, we created hive mind constructs with rats where we taught one rat basically down in South America to go through a maze. We connected it up to the internet, connected a rat in New York basically to uh, the internet as well. And the rat in New York instantly knew how to go around the same maze because they actually shared a hive mind. So when I start talking about your lives will literally start looking like you like a novel uh, out of a science fiction novel. I'm not kidding. Um, we already have artificial intelligence politicians coming out of China uh, in the Foreign Office. Um, so now what happens basically when you start putting an artificially intelligent politician onto the blockchain to determine different choices and, you know, determine different policies? You know, so say for example you plug that artificial intelligence politician into, uh, our, into our voting system uh, or into the cryptocurrency an AI can automatically see that part of the Chinese economy is tanked with particular policies. Now, all these new technologies also carry sort of a number of different problems. When we have a look at artificial intelligence and when we have a look at blockchain, you can see from this particular graph here that the compute, the petaflops that are now being used by artificial intelligence is almost going vertical. Blockchain's power consumption is pretty much going vertical. Um, and this creates a problem. So what we have is we have these incredibly powerful technologies, but they are sucking up huge amounts of computing power, which is unsustainable, and huge amounts of electricity, which is also unsustainable, even if it is from renew renewable sources, which most of it isn't. Um, so today, basically, we have a whole variety of different problems, and these problems are growing at an exponential rate. However, when we start having a look at how we can use some new technologies and do new things in new ways to start, uh, shall we say, tipping the balance in, back in our favor. Um, when we look at artificial intelligence, basically we've got intelligence processing units, which are 100 times more efficient than the most efficient GPUs from NVIDIA. Um, we have shallow neural networks, again, coming out of the U US network. We recently had a neural network that had 19 nodes and it managed to successfully control a fully autonomous car, bearing in mind that most neural networks, if you take Google's um, uh, natural language processing system or OpenAI's GPT-3 natural language processing system, um, Google's uh, natural language uh, artificial intelligence has got 1.6 trillion parameters. They're just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But shallow neural networks kind of help help us readjust, readjust the balance. You can also then put these shallow neural networks at the edge of the network, and that allows you to do a whole variety of new things. Um, when we look at blockchain, uh, we have things like mineless blockchains, courtesy of uh, IOTA, as well as Microsoft. So they use something called proof of authority. Um, so you don't have to mine a blockchain in a traditional way. We can then use renewable energy and a couple of other things. So all of these new technologies 
solve problems, they also create problems, but then that's where human ingenuity comes back into play to try to solve some of those problems again. Um, and then we're on to the sort of the last piece here. Um, but I want to spend some time going through this. So when you leave university, everything's going to look uh, linear. Can I interject, Matthew? Yes, absolutely. Uh, wow, I mean, my head aches. I can't tell whether to be op optimistic or pessimistic about the future, but we can discuss that in a yeah. few minutes. Um, at some comfortable time, it can be now or it yeah. can be when you complete this module, we should take a five or 10 minute break. Yeah. So I just wanted to give you a heads up and you decide when, when the appropriate time is. No, that's fine. So if we do this and then that'll be it. And because uh, I think this this particular section basically really starts putting it into contrast. Um, so as you all start going into different companies, most of those companies are going to look fairly samey. They're going to operate in a fairly similar way. They're all going to throw, you know, digital and cloud and all these sort of other sort of names and lingos at you and everything else. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how you will be able to use technology in your either today, these are available today, but in your future work life to 100x your potential, but also to learn how to do pretty much everything without learning it. Um, so the world used to be local and linear, but now thanks to digital technologies, you know, if you want to be able, if you want to reach out to someone on the other side of the planet, it's, it's, it's easier than ever before. Let's face it. So digital technologies have made the world smaller. And anyone basically who has a device that is connected to a network, irrespective of whether they're on the moon, um, is able to access the entire digital economy. Um, and for example, when we start talking about the moon, uh, Nokia and Vodafone are actually putting a 4G network onto the moon. So uh, the astronauts will be able to connect it, connect when Jeff Bezos builds his lunar, lunar uh, village uh, in about 2025 to 2030. Um, however, when we start looking at the future of work, forget what you think the future of work might look like, because it's not work from home, it's work from anywhere. So during COVID, we actually had in the UK, uh, down at St. Bart's Hospital, we had a whole variety of different cancer surgeons who ended up getting COVID. So they ended up being in lockdown and they had to be they had to work from home. However, those surgeons were able to conduct surgeries from home using teleoperations, telepresence, augmented reality technologies. Now, this is a particular technology out of China, but this is a robotics technology that uses 5G. So in this particular case, this uh, surgeon is going to be using artificial intelligence, teleoperations, uh, drone robotics, and 5G to operate on a patient that is 50 miles away.其实五G呢，就是让我们可以做到在呃很多场合，比如说救灾的场合，还有一些像边防上，还有一些呢，就是说像我们将来的基层和大型医院的连接，我们完全可以做到，就是让外科医生做到一个标准化的素质，一个人
そうですね。チャレンジャスウィニーワイズオフシーン。ディープナーアンダースタンディング。アンエンリッチアーライブス。最後一笔就是说，往前。Great things h a p p e a closer look at it. Place this here. Let's see how we go from there, okay? This sense of collaboration and the feelings of connection it brings excites us. Hey, just in time. I'm going to move it slightly, okay? It's yours. Take it. We have two planes right now on the same trajectory. As we put people first, technology fades into the background and feels like anything but. Aisha, what do you think? I think if we head 330, maintaining 2800, we'll be clear for approach. Excellent. This changes the way we see the world, and in turn, changes the world we see. These numbers are looking great, actually. There's promise in the possibilities, and what we see and create next will stretch the imagination. Good morning, Sarah. Morning. Slowly coming towards the thumb. A world without boundaries. Good job. A lot better than yesterday. Yeah. Excellent. Slowly bring the. A world where technology enhances, not limits humanity. With people front, center, and in the spotlight. The future is here, and here can be anywhere. Introducing Microsoft Mesh. Furthermore, when we start talking about 100xing human potential, all of these different technologies—for example, the big virtual reality glasses or headsets that you see today—they're going to be in glass form. So Facebook already have virtual reality glasses. Same with Panasonic. When we have a look at contact lenses and being able to access these digital worlds, basically through smart contact lenses, Mojo Vision have already got or working that you can wear、uh, augmented reality contact lenses. Technology basically gets smaller, more powerful, cheaper, more ubiquitous. Get the idea. Watson,、um, I need help with acquisitions. What about using、Hello. artificial intelligence? How can I help you with mergers and acquisitions? Watson, show me companies with revenue between twenty-five million dollars and sixty million dollars pertaining to analytics. Let's see what I can find. I found eighty-seven companies. Nice. Okay, so that's a good start. What、that's、do you think, Brian? But I was doing some homework actually. I think we should pull on that Watson Strategy Group document. There's a lot of key concepts in there. Let's feed it to Watson. All right. Watson, please regard this as cognitive strategy. Watson, show me companies with revenue between fifteen million dollars and sixty million dollars pertaining to cognitive strategy. Let's see what I can find. Yeah, this is nice. I found one hundred twelve companies. Now we're getting a lot in here, and we can see we're, we're getting some connections too. I think. Watson, show me companies that are about analytics and cognitive strategy that are most similar to the companies named Wolfram Alpha and Kawasaki Robotics. I found three companies、huh? similar to the、oh. ones you specified. Beautiful. Well, let's see what we think of these. Dive a little deeper. Let's compare these things. Sure. Watson, show me a decision table. Here is a decision table that will enable you to compare companies side by side. Watson, place the companies named Wolfram Alpha and Kawasaki Robotics and Cognolytics and Raytheon BBN Technologies and Decisive Analytics in the decision table. Okay. Okay, but I think we need a little more than that. We need some、uh, other attributes. Watson, place the attributes named revenue and employees and corporate structure in the decision table. Okay. All right. So now、uh, we've got this side-by-side -side comparison. What do you think? Yeah, I think、uh, that's right. Watson, give me a suggestion. I have a suggestion. So, what happens when you start working with artificial intelligence as your teammate? AIs like the ones from Google and DeepMind learn new things in fundamentally different ways to humans. So, to give you an example, as a human, you will learn one way, and artificial intelligence will learn a completely different way.、Um, now, when we have a look at Gary Kasparov, for example, we had a artificial intelligence beat the world's chess champion. When people went back to him decades later and say, you know, you were the top of your game, but you must have been—he must have felt really hurt when you were beaten by an artificial intelligence. The surprising thing is, he turned around and said, "No, 
because the AI taught him how to play in a different way. It taught him strategies he would never have thought of. And it's the same basically with the Go champion, basically with uh, DeepMind AlphaGo um, and MooZero and all these other sort of different AIs. So what happens when you combine human ingenuity with, should we say, synthetic ingenuity? Um, that's limitless. Uh, in Increasingly, we're seeing artificial intelligences actually starting to coach people. So some of the digital humans I've been showing you, companies like Coursera are now simply writing their lecture notes, transcribing that straight to deep fake, and then they have digital human lecturers, basically, that are actually sort of teaching. Um, we also have digital teachers out of New Zealand that have taught over 250,000 students about uh, renewable energy. But uh, we even have artificial intelligences at the moment that are coaching call center staff for companies like MetLife on how to be more empathetic. So artificial intelligence works in one way, learns in one way, plays in, another, plays in one way. But increasingly, it's helping us learn those new ways. So we are now hybrid learners. Um, however, and we're sort of getting to some, some of the sort of more interesting stuff now. At the moment, when you leave university, you are going to be what's called a T-shaped individual. You will have a deep domain expertise that an individual company will hire you specifically for your expertise in that field. However, Google democratized access to information. When you start putting AI into the internet and into the systems and things around us and put a behavioral interface, like a voice interface over the top of it, all of a sudden we can democratize access to expertise and skills. If, for example, if you don't know how to program, in the future that's not a problem. We've got low-code and no-code platforms, Microsoft, Microsoft Deep Coder, Google, Bayou. We can simply talk to an artificial intelligence and say, build me a program that looks like this, and those AIs will already go off, scavenge code from GitHub, Stack Overflow, compile it back and say, is that the application you wanted? You didn't have to learn how to code. Um, however, um, if any of you are crappy artists, because that's something you can't necessarily teach, um, this is just something from Gogan. So increasingly, as we automate more jobs, more tasks, more things, we put a behavioral interface over the top of that, I can give you access to that. And if you're a crappy artist, I can give you access to an artificial intelligence that will turn you into a Let's Picasso. Let's that up a bit with some cloud. Oh, that's wonderful. What if we were to change all that to, to rock? Okay, let's click on rock, and then we can replace the mountain. Let's try waterfall just by pulling water down from the top there. Okay. Wouldn't it be great if everybody could be an artist? If we could take our ideas and turn them into compelling images? This technology allows us to create a smart paintbrush so that if you wanted to create a new picture, you can just draw the shapes of the objects that you want, and the neural network can then fill in all the details. If we add a water feature, the network is able to add reflections, not because we told it that, but because it learned it. Or if we change the ground to be covered in snow, then it knows that the sky also needs to be a different color. I really think this technology is going to be great for architects, designers, people making virtual worlds to train robots and self-driving cars. The input to this model is something we call a segmentation map. It's like a coloring book picture that describes, here's where a tree is, here's where the sky is, here's where the ground is, and it doesn't have any details. And then the neural network is able to fill in all the texture and shadows and the colors based on things that it's learned from a large database of real-world images. I would like to see a tree reflecting in that pond. The real advance here is that we're able to synthesize images with a lot more diversity and more fidelity than we were able to in the past. I really think this technology is going to be great for the dreamers of the world. So what about making products? And there are two videos left. So what if I could accelerate your rate of product innovation by 10, 100? a thousand, ten thousand, a million fold, a billion fold. We have those technologies already coming through today. 
We're told that artificial intelligence can't be creative, but creation is a process. If you can bake that process into steps, you can turn it into an algorithm, you can turn the algorithms into a model, you can create what was called an, a creative artificial intelligence. So this here is a combination of different technologies, but this is one of the world's first self-evolving, self-manufacturing robots. So what we have is, this is from the University of Oslo, we have a robot here that is being tasked with moving from one side of the lab to the other as quickly as possible. It's packed with sensors. Those sensors are feeding information back to a creative artificial intelligence that is running innovations in simulation. So it's trying tens of thousands of new designs every minute to try to come up with the perfect second generation robot that will move from one side of the room to the other faster than the original. And then once the artificial intelligence has created its new second generation robot, it can send the designs and the wireframes to a 3D printer, where those parts are 3D printed, that technician assembles those parts and puts the robot back on the floor to do its thing. However, if you swap the 3D printer for a 4D printer where the fourth dimension is time, as we did a little while ago with a particular American university, you end up with a robot that can 4D print itself and walk off the printer and it can repeat, send information back to the creative machine and you get generation version 3, version 4. So these are already being used and I'll give you some examples from companies that you know. Now, if we start running simulations, companies like Amazon are already using the following basically to help them accelerate the development of autonomous vehicles by billions of fold. Um, we can do new things. So this is the creation of the world's most dexterous robot hand. In this particular example, OpenAI trained a robot, trained a simulated robot hand using hundreds of years of experience in a couple of weeks to create this. Can you do this? We're trying to build robots that learn a little bit like humans do by trial and error. What we've done is train an algorithm to solve the Rubik's Cube one-handed with a robotic hand, which is actually pretty hard even for a human to do. We don't tell it how the hand needs to move the, the cube in order to get there. The particular friction that's on the fingers, how easy it is to turn the faces on the cube, what the gravity, what the weight of the cube is, all of these things, it needs to learn by itself. The interesting thing is that kind of standard techniques in robotics haven't been able to scale to that complexity that we see in a robotic hand. Humans have evolved to be able to manipulate and operate our hands. So there's a huge amount of learning that's happened through evolution to get us to this point as a, as a species. And the robot has to learn all of this from scratch. Instead of trying to write very dedicated algorithms to operate such a hand, we took a different approach where we create thousands of different simulated environments and learn to do the task in all of those. And hopefully a robotic hand will be able to do it in the real world as well. This means like thousands of years of experience that this neural network has had in simulation. Every time the algorithm has gotten good at the task, we make the task harder. That's really crucial because it needs exposure to really complicated environments in order to eventually be robust to the real world. You put a rubber glove on the hand and it can still carry out the task. This ability to generalize to new environments feels like a very core piece of intelligence. It really changes the way we think about training general purpose robots. Moving from thinking too much about the actual algorithms 
and start thinking about how do we create complex enough worlds where they can learn. At some point, then it would be more down to the imagination what robots could actually accomplish. The hope is to build robots that can do many different tasks to increase the standard of living and give everybody a better life. And when you have the world's most, robo most dexterous robotic hand, you can create robotic pickers in Amazon warehouses that are faster than humans. And then you end up with a dark Amazon warehouse, aside from a whole bunch of other things. And as we're made by machines, basically Airbus basically are using creative artificial intelligences to help them design the A330neo. Uh, we've got in silico, which used an artificial intelligence to help them design 30,000 new drugs in 21 days. And some of those were blockbusters. Um, in addition to that, when you have a look at the COVID vaccines, it normally takes 10 years to develop and produce a vaccine. The reason why we've been able to do it in eight months with companies like Pfizer and AstraZeneca and Oxford University is because we used artificial intelligence and supercomputers and uh, a whole variety of new things. We've got NASA using artificial intelligences to design uh, lunar rovers that are 30% lighter than anything that the PhDs at JPL have been able to come up with in decades. Uh, we've also got Under Armour that has been using artificial intelligence to create a $300 architect sneaker that you can buy on the internet. Um, and in that particular case, Under Armour used an artificial intelligence to design the sneaker that could be 3D printed. So you cut an 18 month product life cycle down from concept to shelf, down to two days. Um, the speed of change is accelerating. And we can also use these same synthetic machines basically to create content. So think synthetic media, synthetic video, basically think kind of deep fakes on steroids. We've got artificial intelligence pop stars that are being signed by Sony and Warner. We've got procedural games that are being made by AIs from OpenAI, basically, that change according to the user. Then you never see the same thing twice. We've got an artificial intelligence that's written a book. Um, now, from a university perspective, one of the problems you might have when you started looking at PhDs is you have to ingest huge volumes of new information. Take, for example, in healthcare. These AIs can condense all that information into something that's manageable. So you can catch up on all of the latest cancer research information by reading just essentially a narrative. Um, and then we've also got AIs that are producing new virtual reality worlds and all kinds of things. And this is all just the tip of the iceberg. The future is limitless. Your potential is limitless. And when you start using and experimenting with all of these different innovations, technologies and things, you'll find basically that the world basically is an amazing place. So I hope you've enjoyed uh, the, uh, the lecture and it's been my pleasure and my privilege to be able to share this all with you. And uh, thank you very much. Take care.